like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it, and nothing in the universe can take this. I can see it clearly now, nothing gonna bring me down. Welcome to the National University of Singapore, Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine, Healthy uh, Longevity Webinar Series. It's a mouthful. I'm going to screw that up sooner or later, but so far I've got it right. Um, it's really exciting. This is our second uh, talk on biomarkers of aging, and we have Jackie Han here to give us a lecture. Uh, during the lecture, please use the Q&A function to ask questions. Um, well, I'm back in Singapore. If you watched last week, you saw me from a ski lodge in Utah. And so now I'm paying the price for that with my two week quarantine in an undisclosed hotel location. Uh, so hence the background. Um, I'm surviving so far. Uh, before we start with Jackie, though, I want to, I've asked Daniel Tay, one of our postdocs to come on and tell you a little bit about a recent paper on the microbiome and aging from local scientists. So I'll turn it over to Daniel. Thank you, Prof. Kennedy, for the introduction. Hi, this is Daniel, interdisciplinary senior postdoc from the Center for Healthy Longevity. In today's research article sharing, we'll be discussing about the work by Kundu et al. from the laboratory of Professor Sven Patterson, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. We all know the central dogma of healthy intervention research is about introducing youth phenotype into age subjects. However, in this case, the author did pretty much the opposite. Before we proceed further, I should advise the audience to not try this at home. Aging causes change in the gut microbiota that has co-evolved together with its host. Likewise, shifts in the gut microbiota is communicated to the brain and also the physiology of the body. In this paper, the authors transplanted fecal samples from old mice into young mice and investigated their phenotype. To begin with, they look at neurogenesis, a process of new neuron re regeneration in the brain that is highly associated with memory formation. Neurogenesis declines across age and is the pivot to dementia and neurodegenerative diseases. Neuron stain with double cotton also shown in red here at the hippocampus in the brain was significantly higher in young mice that had been transplanted with fecal matter from old mice. This is in stark contrast of what we would have predicted and it's accompanied by an increase in brain-derived neurotrophic factors. You can see here BDNF, a critical growth factor to support neuronal maturation and survivability. In table one, metabolic profiling of the hippocampus tissue from here revealed distinct and increased abundance of metabolites that are associated with neurogenesis and maturations of neurons. Furthermore, assessment of the blood-brain barrier integrity suggests no major differences between both young and old mice transplanted group. Now, because it's a fecal transplant, this prompted the authors to also characterize the intestinal tracts of these two groups of animals. In the old microbiota transplant recipient, or short form for MT, the ultrastructure suggests an increase in the length of beef 
length and width of the villi as seen here. This was attributed to the higher number of proliferating intestinal crypt cells seen in green here. Collectively, this increase in length and width from the old MT group is translated into a longer small intestine and colon length. An explanation could be due to the changes in gut microbiota, typically strains that are known to regulate the intestinal length and surface area. In terms of in intestinal integrity, there are no evidence to suggest compromise in intestinal permeability from all MT recipient. Additionally, investigations on pro and anti-inflammatory markers show similarities between both groups. Moreover, in this heat map on the right, all empty recipients show metabolic changes in the liver that are distinct from the young empty recipients. In the old empty recipients, an increase in cytoprotective unfolded protein response UPR and a simultaneous decline in triglyceride biosynthesis was observed. UPR signaling here is known to decline with age, but in this case has been reversed with old empty transplantation. Does this a suggestive of microbial link to adaptive stress tolerance in the host? To understand the mechanism underlying prolonged longevity effect of all microbiota transplant in young mice, the authors compared the metagenomes of young mice at microbiota transplant with all mice microbiota transplant. They discovered an enrichment of butyrate producing bacteria in the old MT recipient mice. As butyrate is known to regulate BDNF expression, which may explain the increase in neurogenesis, butyrate also regulates the expression of FGF21, which correlates with an increased AMPK and CERT1 activation and decreased mTOR signaling, which have a longevity effect. An important point found by the author is that this gut microbiota effect was found to be age-specific as when the authors transplanted young fecal matters to older mice, there were no similar observational effect. Finally, to prove that this longevity phenotype is due to enriched butyrate microbiota, young mice were given sodium butyrate directly. The observable phenotype in these mice recapitulated to that of the old MT recipients. In conclusion, given that the ability of the gut microbiota to response to dietary, metabolic, and environment changes, this paper implies that the gut microbiota of an old host with metabolic homeostasis may support host health. You are what you eat, and I hope you like today's presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Um, and it's a great pleasure to have Jackie here to give a talk. I've known Jackie for years. We've had a lot of interesting conversations on aging, and I know I've learned a lot. Uh, uh, so it's been a lot of fun. Uh, she's a professor at Peking University and also an adjunct professor here at National University of Singapore, where she's helping us out with some of our clinical studies. Um, she, her lab does a lot of really interesting work on structural and dynamic interfaces of molecular networks. Uh, don't worry if you don't understand that. I don't understand it either, but I think her talk will be exciting anyway. Uh, the title of her talk is Heterogeneity of Aging in Human Populations. So uh, great to have you on, Jackie, and thanks for doing the talk. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Brian for the invitation and for this opportunity to present in this really wonderful um, aging talk series. It's, it's complicated. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, I brought in my topic a little bit more on um, trajectory and heterogeneity of development of and aging. In particular, I'd like to introduce uh, one of our recent technologies called uh, GeoSec. Um, this is basically a micro dissection coupled with single cell RNA-seq technology. What we do is we, uh, for a given sample, we micro dissect into very small um, into very small sample size that contain about 10 to 20 cells per sample. And these samples will have a spatial label so that once we sequence these uh, samples, we can reconstruct the samples uh, spatial domains and also 
the relationship among this uh, spatial domains, even dynamic relationships that will form a lineage tree. In this case, is the mouse gas relation process. We have also applied this uh, together with another collaborator. I, sh I should mention this was done with uh, my collaborator in the Institute of uh, Biochemistry and Cell Biology, uh, Nai He Jing and Gong Dun Peng, who's now moving, uh, who already moved to uh, Canton. And we also uh, use the same technology, geosic for zebrafish, hematopoiesis process. And in this case, we also micro dissected several regions that are known to be related to the zebrafish uh, blood system formation. And based on this inter interactions of different ligand receptors across the different regions, we can trace down where the uh, stem cell is originating and what are the signals stimulating the stem cell proliferation and development. So overall, um, the reason I'm introducing this is that hopefully we can also use this for the aging process. For example, in uh, aging tissue um, and geosic can uniquely be used to map both spatial and temporal uh, transcriptome dynamics. And also um, this spatial and temporal domains revealed can rebuild the lineage uh, of the domains and also the signaling regulation of the, uh, this dynamics, uh, even in vivo stemness regionalization. Now I'm going to really focus on aging and human aging first. Uh, we know that um, many of the aging related transcriptome changes are either regulated by epigenetic changes <coughs> or even memorized by epigenetic changes. <coughs> so one of this epigenetic mark H3K27 acetylation is a mark that decorate um, the enhancers and promoters mostly. But uh, when we did this for human brain prefrontal cortex samples during the aging process, what we found was surprisingly it's not only distributed in the enhancers and promoters, but on this aging upregulated, transcriptionally upregulated genes. They actually have very broad um, gene body distribution. And this distribution decreases with age significantly, whereas the same type of pattern do not exist in age downregulated genes um, that are they're transcriptionally downregulated. So, um, and you can see some of these cases. What are these genes? And if, oh, if we do the, uh, why it just won't stay? If we look at the gene expression patterns using RNA-seq on the same uh, pre uh, human, brain, human brain samples, we can see all of this age upregulated genes are related to inflammatory response, uh, whereas the age downregulated genes are related to the brain specific uh, functions such as the neuron functions. And what we found was that in, in contrast to the gene activation process by H3K27 acetylation on promoters or enhancers, the effect on this gene body distribution is actually inhibitory to gene transcription. In that if we inhibit this um, H3K27 acetylation by um, actually we rescue this uh, H3K27 acetylation by HDAC inhibitors, we can see those genes are being repressed. So that indicate 
at least some of this uh, inflammatory response during chronically activated inflammatory response or overactivation of the inflammatory response is due to the um, decrease of H3K27 trimethylation on the gene body regions. One thing you can probably already notice is that although we identified the H upregulated or H downregulated genes um, among this cohort, um, you can see even though when we put nine samples for each age group, you can still see a lot of variations in particular during the middle age. So that indicate for humans, there are a lot of cross individual heterogeneity in the aging, uh, aging related transcriptomes or other patterns. In order to measure this age related uh, changes or heterogeneities of individuals during the aging process, various age clock uh, have been generated, such as the most famous is perhaps DNA methylation clock. Um, and uh, Steve Howard and many others are now working on using generating a very generic DNA methylation age clock for every tissue, even every organism. And for us, we're interested in a very simple clock, that is the facial morphology change. And um, in this very first attempt to validate whether such an idea is valid, <clears throat> we um, collected 320, 320 individuals from Beijing area. And here shows the individuals, the average phase of each decade. Uh, and here is an average of 30 individuals shown here of 20 years old, 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. You can already capture by eye some of the age-related changes, um, such as the eye corner drop, and also the increase of number of wrinkles on the face. But if we build a linear model, we can further quantitatively capture this uh, changes. And shown here um, are the first two component linearly related to age. And we just visualize it here using this mean average phase, mean phase or average phase of all the females in the cohort. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see that with our model, we can not only capture this uh, age-related increase of wrinkles and uh, eye corner job, but also we even more, we, we even captured something subtle to the eye. That is, uh, for example, the forehead change and the uh, lower, the protrusion of the lower jaw. So initially we have built a linear model as I just uh, showed you. And the linear model was, uh, was based on only 300 people, which is not very accurate compared to the DNA methylation clock. Um, at that stage, the DNA methylation clock was having a deviation of around four years and our clock was six years deviation. But because our clock, the method we used is just taking 3D facial images, which is very easily to extend to large cohort and also um, very cheap and non-invasive. So um, in the past four years, actually five years, we collected for four years, uh, we collected about 500 individuals 3D facial images um, per year. And based on this large cohort, even this, uh, this paper is about the first year, 2016's um, data. 
Even based on this 5,000 individuals, we can now use AI to generate a nonlinear and more precise model to predict age. So here is the structure we used. We used a three CNN model, um, convoluted neural network. All three of them are very mature models and um, largely they are, reply, they, they are mainly uh, suitable for 2D images, but we have 3D images. Um, then we converted, that's why we converted the 3D images to four channel 2D images. That is RGB three channels and also the depth here shows the depth the Z axis um, is another channel. And based on this CNN model, uh, we predicted three different age, uh, ages. One is the predicted chronological age. And also, um, hmm, actually we, we did two uh, CNN models and also a linear model to compare. Show here is the uh, CNN model of chronological age being trained by the chronological age. You can see that now this um, clock is really the most accurate clock. Um, I don't know what, what other clock is more accurate than this. 2.78 or 2.79 years, um, the mean average uh, deviation mean absolute deviation or mean absolute error. Compared to this, the, um, if we apply the previous PLS model, the linear model, the deviation is 4.5 years. On the same cohort, um, before it was six years, it's reduced a bit because of the large sample size. And also, Face has a unique biological marker that is a biological uh, age marker. That is the perceived age. The perceived age is basically uh, the age on this face judged by other people. And it has been already used for, I don't know, two decades. And a lot of paper already shown that it's uh, a biomarker to capture many health related uh, status. And shown here is the uh, perceived age we generated for this cohort. Essentially each phase, we have five individuals, five judges to judge its face, uh, to, to judge its image and then gave a um, age prediction. And this perceived age has a similar performance to the linear model, the PLS age. Another interesting thing we did was that we asked, can we actually train the AI model to learn how human perceive age? So what, instead of using chronological age to train a model, uh, we now, train the AI model using the perceived age. And interestingly, this AI model that can pre per uh, predict perceived age actually corrected, corrected some of the human errors so that the difference of the prediction is actually reduced uh, uh, against the actual age. So now this MAD is reduced to 4.1 compared to this input 4.5. Then um, you may ask, why do we care about all these accurate predictions? First of all, if we only look at the chronological age, you cannot distinguish the error versus the true deviation of the biological age. You have to only focus on the outliers. Um, Secondly, uh, then if you look at this um, biological age trend um, model, even within this error range, whatever is predicted is still the biological age, it's the perceived age. So even within this error range, 
it's meaningful. Um, I think I have a slide to demonstrate that. Um, and also the third reason is that using linear models, um, including our previous publications and many other uh, DM isolation clocks, if you use the linear model, you always see this deviation or the difference of aging rate. Basically aging rate is defined by the predicted age minus actual age, the difference between the two. The, the difference, um, in fact, across different individuals uh, during the aging process, monotonically increase with age, which was interpreted by um, with age, there's always a accumulation of life history. That's why you increase in the uh, variation. However, if we look at more accurate nonlinear models, even our, even our uh, predicted uh, perceived age model, you can see this variation is actually the highest in middle age instead of in monotonic increase with age. That is our difference start to, uh, to increase right before around 40 years old and then uh, peak between 40 to 60 years. Is this true? In order to uh, quantitatively illustrate this, we also extracted around, uh, I don't know, maybe 15 different um, quantitative parameters, such as forehead height, um, lip, lip thickness, et cetera. These are based on the, uh, the, the uh, how do I say, landmarks, the landmarks uh, defined on each face after registering, uh, aligning all the face together. We can see that here we organize all, all of these individuals uh, according to their age. And you can see in young people, there's one pattern and in old people, there's another pattern. Whereas in between this middle age have a lot of heterogeneity. Some people are already very old here, whereas other people um, are still very young looking even, even here. And this is the same for male. And the next question you may want to ask is um, whether you, if somebody look young, um, does he or she is really young in their blood? Um, in order to address that, we also um, performed the, the transcriptum RNA-seq of the small Beijing cohort, the 300 individual cohort. And then we examine, because this is a linear model, um, we can only, uh, and also that is trained on, on the chronological age, we can only look at the outlier overlap instead of the global correlation. And the outliers indeed significantly overlap between the transcriptome clock, which is this, uh, we're here. This is the transcriptome, the green is the transcriptome clock, um, whereas the other colors are the three uh, facial clock. In fact, this is highly, highly significant for the younger outliers and also significant in the older outliers, but not so, not so significant um, within the normal prediction range. So that indicate if somebody look younger, look young, um, he or, uh, his or her blood is very likely to be also very young. And here uh, shows what I just mentioned. If we compare all of these clocks, we can see this perceived age, especially the thin and perceived age, that is correcting some, some of the errors of the perceived age. 
is highly associated and broadly associated with uh, many health parameters and also lifestyles compared to many other uh, age predictors. This is the HD, the uh, age, aging rate predicted by various clocks. So that indicates this is really a good biomarker even compared to the chronological HD trend uh, age clock. And since we have all these blood samples, we can ask what are the molecular features related to accelerated uh, aging measured by all these clocks? Um, you can see that almost for all of these clocks, accelerated aging is highly associated with inflammation and infections. And this is, uh, but on the other side, it's not so uh, uniform. So this inflammation association with uh, accelerated aging rate can be also substantiated by the monocyte number in the blood. Higher monocyte number indicates it's a, a chrono, uh, chronic inflammation marker. And indeed that is highly significantly associated with the uh, face age or even blood age, blood accelerated blood age, accelerated face age. And shown here is the pattern of increasing um, monocyte count on the face. You can see with more monocyte count, um, essentially the face look older and uh, in particular with the shrinkage on the forehead and uh, protrusion on the nose part. And also um, because of this small cohort, we, we did very thorough and quantitative lifestyle and uh, questionnaires such as um, how many cigarettes uh, you're smoking per day or like uh, this, for each of these lifestyle parameters, we have five different quanti quantitative levels so that we can actually quantitatively measure what are these uh, parameters, the lifestyle parameters what parameters are, from lifestyles can impact the face clocks and through what blood transcriptome uh, molecules. And this is done uh, by using a causal inference test. Essentially in this network, here are the mediators we inferred that mediating in the blood, that mediating this lifestyle impact. The red indicate a uh, positive association or positive causal relationship. The uh, direction is causality. Um, for example, here, we inferred that cigarette smoking can increase the expression of many inflammatory cytokines in the blood thus increase this uh, facial aging clocks. Whereas coffee drinking and yogurt can uh, mostly uh, modify, repress, mostly repress the, uh, some of the transcription factors and here this is a surface receptor um, transporter and thus uh, slow down the uh, aging clocks. Uh, to summarize this part, uh, what we found was that human age with very different aging rate across different individuals, in particular at middle age, but currently, uh, but coherently in the blood and on the face. And many of these differences can be attributed to lifestyles and partially to drugs, which I didn't discuss. And um, blood transcriptome may mediate this lifestyle impact and deep learning CNN, net, CNN networks can help to accurately estimate aging rate and such more reliably detect heterogeneity and association. Actually, I prepared uh, some 
other small uh, one other small story, but I'm running out of time. I think um, I I will just read this. You can read our paper if you are interested. Um, we, in addition to a uh, human study, we also used the elegance as a model to screen for endogenous metabolite to extend lifespan. In the process, we identified inositol, uh, we, yeah, inositol, which we found that uh, it can activate P10 and also um, through um, this molecule called P2. And this effect is partially mediated by metophagy activated by P10. And with that, I'd like to stop here and thanking um, mostly, uh, I listed all the people who work on this facial image clock. And this was done in collaboration with uh, Yong Zhou, who's in, a doctor from Jiao Tong University. Um, and also this is in collaboration. Uh, Brian uh, also helped us to draft the manuscript. Uh, also some um, really wonderful insight from Carlo Canestrachi. Thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Jackie. And uh, before we start with questions, I wanna remind everyone or tell everyone that uh, we have a free ebook that's now gonna be available for people who have registered. The book is The Science of Aging, Healthy Longevity, and we have a number of people here that contributed to it. So hopefully it'll be helpful to you as you think about uh, the aging process. Uh, you can find that online. So Jackie, I think the real secret to why I like your clock so much is you can show that coffee is good for aging, which is makes me feel better. Is I, 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 as, I noticed, what's that? As you're drinking now. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I will come back to those specific uh, uh, determinants in a minute. Before we get into facial pattern aging, though, I wanted to just ask a couple questions about your first slides. Uh, you talked about you know, trying to look at development to try to understand how stem cells are regulated. And that leads into sort of a broader question about uh, the relationship between development and aging. You know, transcriptionally, some people have proposed that the transcriptional changes you see in old age are almost a reverse of those that occur during development. I, I, what do you think about that? I, how much can we learn about aging from looking at development? Well, um, actually we, we did try to exactly examine this association um, using many developmental data to try to predict the age clock of, across different species. Um, and uh, essentially, we didn't really get a very good uh, prediction. Uh, we tried for about a year, and finally, we don't think there's a, a very strong or uniform link, at least from the data we collected from embryogenesis. Um, maybe it's not that early. What my thought was uh, maybe the aging clock is already predetermined during embryogenesis. Um, even across many different mammals, that's another issue. We only have about four to five species of, of mammals to compare. Um, maybe it's the data set is too small. On the other hand, as I have showed you, many of this aging rate is really determined not by genetics. It's by lifestyle, it's by epigenetics and other things. And in particular, you can see that when we start out, even at younger age, the clock is more uniform. Only at middle age, we start to diverge a lot. So I, my, my, yeah, I don't think there's uh, absolutely, it's all determined by development. Yeah, I think that's, that's not when you when you think about aging that's not that surprising that the divergence happens around middle age i think that that's when we some people still are very healthy and other people are starting to get chronic diseases and so it kind of fits with what we know about the biology of aging right yeah um just a, a you know a couple uh questions i i want to come back to these different clocks and and um particularly on the 
the first clock you mentioned is trained to chronologic age. You're using AI to uh, and inputting several different uh, parameters of facial structure and using the AI to optimize, in that case, the chronologic age. And you sort of commented on this, but I wonder if you could go into a little bit deeper. Uh, once you have the AI prediction, you can go back and look at those in the contribution of each individual component. And so can you tell us which were the main components that were predictive of age? And maybe is that tell us anything about mechanistic drivers of aging? Yeah, uh, well, initially uh, when we had this uh, AI predictor, uh, we want to know what is in this black box. Um, the, there are several ways you can do now, but in, in the very beginning, um, the very easy way is to just hide each different area region and ask whether this reduced the accuracy. What we found was that there's a pattern that is um, in from young to old. Initially, the AI clock is actually looking at the eye area and gradually it's moving away from the eye area. In the old, it has to be mostly on the, on the chin and on the forehead. So um, at different age range, um, intervals, the, the regions are different. And now we're using some other technologies to more precisely identify the components um, giving rise to age-related predictors. So when the AI was driven toward perceived age rather than actual age, uh, how did those components change? What does that tell us about how humans are predicting age? Yeah, uh, we actually have a manuscript now right being written. Um, what we compared was that, um, what is the difference between the chronological age predictor and the perceived age predictor, predicted age diff, but where the features uh, are different. What we found was the chronological age predictor largely focused on the structure, the morphology. Uh, whereas when human looking at a face, it's more focused on the color. Interesting. Uh, yeah, that's that's why I think. Uh, in fact, I we we just did a African cohort. I don't think the perceived age actually will ever work uh, from Asian to Africa. Well, it may work, but it'll be different parameters, I guess, that drive that. The morphology works, but the uh, color totally. Yeah, but people people can still perceive age in that you know in that ethnicity. I would imagine. I, I guess the question is, what is the how well do people do perceiving age in different ethnicities? I mean, I would. This is going to sound you know, naive, but I, I feel kind of the opposite. You know, when I'm looking at a Caucasian, for instance, I feel pretty good at predicting their age and I can never make that prediction in Asians. So I, I naively, I would guess that it'd be easier to do it in other ethnicities. Uh, yeah, we, we already have this comparison. Um, it's very interesting. The Asian clock can always overestimate um, other ethnic groups age, um, the African or uh, Caucasian, uh, whereas trained the other way around, if we train based on the African, uh, it's, but only on the facial morphology, it can actually predict pretty well the other ethnic groups, mm. indicating maybe, well, Africans are our ancestors. Yeah, I was going to ask, does that, I mean, we all came from Africa, right? Is that just uh, some uh, conserved element that's, that, that's being preserved in the, in the facial structures? Yeah. Well, that's cool. Um, so, you know, that, that's really interesting that you can compare different ethnicities. So I presume that there's really going to be different clocks for each ethnicity than to uh, at the end of the day, though, to get uh, the maximum accuracy? Uh, yeah. 
But uh, as I said, if we we use African clock, it's pretty accurate for all ethnic groups. So, have you compared the the clocks, the facial clocks, to the methylation clocks? Oh, but there's a catch. It's accurate. It's probably too accurate. It's only capture the chronological age, but not any perceived age. Okay, so <laughs> I, I've been asking everybody this question, so now you're going to get it too. What does over accurate mean? So let me back up for people that may be a little bit lost. So the deviation from the prediction uh, of chronologic age is I, thought to be a measure of the biologic age. So if you're chronologically 50 and it predicts you're 45, it, the idea is you're aging well. Um, but you know, we 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 all look at people who are aging and we see quite a bit of variability. And some of these clocks now have very little deviation. You mentioned one that has two and a half years. Is that overfitting? And if if you're overfitting, what does it mean? How do you what's it measuring if you're overfitting? Right. If it has a zero error. That yeah. will be implicating, you're just measure the at atomic oscillation of something, of the clock. <laughs> right? How do you just get like, that, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's, um, well, you can date like couple uh, carbon dating or something, right? Uh, if you, you just, getting too precise. You're just looking at the, something really chronological. It's just like a real clock. But yeah, on the yeah, hand, it's hard for me to imagine exactly what parameter is driving that. You know, I can, I mean, more or less understand radiocarbon dating, but that, how, how are we getting that from a picture? So. <laughs> yeah, I don't really know um, biologically what that is. Uh -huh. I think, um, one of the big questions people have is, can, I mean, this clock is, one of the great things about it is it's completely non-invasive. People don't have to give blood, they don't have to give tissue samples. Um, all they have to do is stand there for a picture for a minute or two. Um, so it's great, it has great scalability. One of the big questions we wanna know is whether interventions though are gonna impact aging. And do we know anything about whether interventions can reverse or slow down this clock? Um, yeah, in order to do that, we have to set up a, a, a cohort to do it and apply for a different, uh, how do you say, ethnic, uh, um, ethic approval, yeah. which is very difficult. Unless we do uh, something, we actually plan to do one of yogurt in intervention. Um, but eventually we, we haven't really started. That is easy. Uh, you don't have to do a lot of uh, paperwork to get it started. Maybe can in you, Singapore. Can you test coffee first? I, I'd really rather take that than yogurt. Is that is that possible? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you have a cohort, it's very, I, I would expect within uh, maybe three months. Or, mm, yeah, you should see some effect. So, um, you know, I, I think that uh, I'm really uh, excited to try this clock. And, and I think that if you look, you mentioned a lot about heterogeneity and aging. And uh, so people age at different rates. And have you like looked at the comp individual components that, so in other words, if you have two people who are biologically old, is that reflected more or less equally in the different components of the facial age, or is it one person has the eye pattern changed dramatically and another person has the um, protrusion of the of the chin that's very different, or is it just pretty consistent across? Um, there's some some uh, uniform, but not really a hundred percent penetrance patterns. Um, you can see this significant eye corner drop, but it's not happening with everybody. For example, we tested the, the wrinkles. Um, overall, wrinkles have a, a strong correlation with age and also accelerated aging. But if we try to look at individuals, if we separate the different components at different regions, 
all of a sudden the correlation disappear. That implicates it's the total amount of wrinkles on the face, but not for in individual people, they may appear, the wrinkle may I appear see. in different places. I see, when you put the data together though, it, it looks like the total component. Yeah. yeah. Well, anyway, I think what I want to do is uh, bring Jormin in because I'm sure there are a lot of questions from the audience. And uh, before we start, uh, Jormin, yeah, if, if you recall, he's a, a research professor who's organizing our clinical studies. Yeah. You know, this quarantine thing has given me an idea. You know, if we can take the volunteers for our clinical intervention studies and put them in hotel rooms for six months so they can't leave. That'll really reduce the noise. We can control what they eat. We can control how they behave. Do you think that's feasible for our clinical approach? Hello, Brian. Um, thanks for the suggestion, but I don't think that's going to be feasible. You know, I know you're thinking of V-training uh, studies or along the line sedentary behavior. It's a great model, but I don't think that's going to be, it's not going to fly in Singapore. All right. If you try well, flying, you probably wait for five years. All right, I'll keep thinking. I was kind of trying to take the humans and make them like mice, you know, it, it just seemed like a good idea. So <laughs> I think that's like, uh, we, we just built Ethics 101. <laughs> All right, in that case, why don't we go to questions? Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much, Jackie. It's great to see you. And, you know, we do have a number of very interesting questions from the floor. Um, I'll just start the ball rolling since we're running a little bit low on time. And this is probably something that always comes up. Okay. Um, we, someone from uh, uh, the audience was just saying, if somebody receives plastic surgery, would that actually trick the um, algorithm into predicting an incorrect chronological age just based on facial structure? Uh, I would think so. But so far, our uh, cohort does not include, we excluded all the people who did uh, plastic surgery. I see. Well, okay. That, Maybe that, we can do the study in Los Angeles. What do you think? <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I, okay. We have another question, and this one is from Shoping. Shoping asks Can facial aging be trained to associate with any kind of uh, disease condition? Because you what? did mention, for example, you know, it could be tied to inflammation. You know, would, that, would the algorithm be powerful enough to delineate between uh, different chronic diseases? cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, right, we actually use uh, not the facial age too, we just use face, try to predict the facial image, try, try to predict all this disease. In fact, for fatty liver, the accuracy is very uh, good. It's around AUC, around 80, uh, 80%. Um, but for something like cancer, there's really just no power to predict. Maybe cancer is too diverse. Diabetes is not too bad, but the diagnosis of diabetes and also um, whether you, you are taking the medicines to control for that diabetes, I think it's compromising our result. Um, the accuracy is only around uh, 0 0.6. Mm -hmm. I see. Still um, following up on uh, questions on lifestyle, you know, the question from uh, the floor is that the, um, uh, let me just take one, one step back. Can you speculate whether sleep quality and uh, quantity are potential drivers of accelerated aging? And were there any correlations between the number of hours that are slept and um, aging? So this question was posed by Kalpana. Yeah, um, I would expect so, uh, but initially we didn't have in in our cohort uh, study we didn't have a sleep survey in our questionnaires, and from last year we started to um, add this. Hopefully by by the maybe this year, uh, when we analyze last year's data, we will see whether sleep has anything to do. With. I would expect so. Well, we look forward to uh, seeing your results. Well, here's another question. You know, you did mention that the greatest heterogeneity actually happens at middle age. So then is it possible to create an AI um, algorithm that can create a personalized risk profiling of uh, aging effects uh, so that you can actually institute effective interventions? So this question is posed by Zhongwei. 
Yeah, uh, I was just talking to one of my students who's working on AI. Um, I, I, I told him that maybe eventually uh, what we want to do is to give him a face. We want to um, use our AI model to basically the again, uh, gener generative uh, adver adversary network to uh, modify your face based on what lifestyle, how much, for example, how much coffee you need to drink in order to get what look. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully we'll have that also by the end of this. <laughs> um, all right, so Gladys has this question. She's just wondering how accurate is um, the biological age predictor in predicting um, you know, chronological age? Uh, as I showed, it's the deviation is around 4.1 years. Okay. The perceived age. Mm -hmm. clock. And uh, another question from Elena: Would skin conditions then compromise your your facial um, pattern prediction? What condition? Sorry, skin conditions. So, for example, eczema or you know skin oh. allergies. Hmm. That we didn't really know. We we didn't have surveys. Um. In fact, for one of this years we had a um, we had a cosmetic company who sent us the survey questions i don't know if it was implemented or not mm -hmm. i see now we have somebody that wants to know a little bit about diet so peter asked does meal on time that influence aging clocks uh, for the phase does it mean breakfast lunch dinner at an appropriate time or does it include time-restricted feeding? So for example, having breakfast at 11 and then dinner at five o'clock. So, you know, restricting the amount of caloric intake to, you know, between say eight to 10 hours. Um, the meal on time basically just uh, say uh, you, you have regular meal time. Regular meal time. So do you have any data on fasting or time-restricted feeding? Uh, I don't think our cohort our whole cohort, nobody is doing it. In fact, this cohort is slightly obese. All right. Um, so here's also another philosophical question for you, uh, Jackie. So it's been known that diagnosis of diseases from the face is something that has been used for at least 2,000 years in traditional Chinese medicine. All right. And has your research on facial morphometry helped to reconcile the mechanisms that is uh, derived from the viewpoint of traditional Chinese medicine. Have you tried to reconcile that with uh, Western medicine or Western science? Uh, we are implementing this uh, in the next, uh, right after the Chinese New Year, we're going to start another cohort uh, where we, we do have Chinese traditional medicine doctors on board. And they are going to give all the labels of uh, all the states based on all the uh, TCM diagnosis, and then we'll see whether we can use AI to predict something. That's very interesting. So in other words, what you're doing is to ask a um, traditional Chinese physician to predict a person's um, disease or biological age and then see whether AI can beat the person. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of a reverse engineering approach. <laughs> so. Exactly. And also this will, uh, I think the TCM doctors are interested in this because they also want to find um, a scientific uh, evidence for this. So when they see it and we can simulate it, that means there's really scientific. There, there. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll have one last question. Sorry, Brian. We just have one last question from the floor and then I'll hand it over to you. Um, so a member of the audience, um, Way, she asked, you look very young, and what are your ways of keeping yourself young? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> I, we didn't um, plant that question, Jackie. That came just completely from the blue. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, according to our uh, AI model, I, I do look much younger than my chronological age. Um, I don't know, because I study aging. And also, I study AI. <laughs> <laughs> you, haven't I tried that... to, you haven't tried to optimize the clocks to your face, right? <laughs> no cheating. Uh, right? 
Not really. <laughs> but on average, I, I whenever I look at the average face, I think that was my my face. <laughs> I don't know if you have the same. Well, you definitely don't. But many people, when they look at our average faces, oh, I see a lot of similarity to myself. Yeah, I, for some reason, I don't see my face when I look at your pictures, but uh, um, uh, I don't know why. So <laughs> well, we're st we still are very short of Caucasian samples. Yeah. <laughs> you are most welcome to, to yeah, try. You can, you can try anytime. Uh, well, thanks a lot for this, Jackie. It was really great. And thanks, Jorming, as well. The questions were wonderful. Um, I want to remind people to register for future webinars and also uh, tell them that the chat room is open if they want to continue discussions after uh, we finish this talk. Our next speaker, which uh, will be the third in the biomarker series, is Morgan Levine. Uh, she will be on next week and we'll go back to methylation. Um, and uh, before I close, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, uh, celebrities and aging. As you know, celebrities are really interested in aging. Uh, and one of them, Cameron Diaz, has gotten more interested than the others. She's authored two books on health and longevity with uh, Sandra Bark. Uh, and so she's become a bit of an expert. I got a chance to meet her and she's really into this stuff. So I thought we would close with a video of some of Cameron's thoughts on healthy aging and what she wants when she gets older. Thank you very much for attending. There's, a, there's an emotional part of growing older, yes. which uh, we, we give lip service to sometimes, but this is pretty important. Mm -hmm. The value of a positive attitude. Yes. That was also something that was very interesting because again, it affects us on a cellular level, our attitudes, mind, our body follows our mind, right? And everything we know we can push through if we just give it to us, you know, we accept it in ourselves. That's really what we have to do with aging. We have to accept it. And the more you accept it, the better you are with it, the healthier and happier you live, but the longer you live. It adds on, the, the scientific research is about seven and a half years that pe the people who accept that they are aging and that they can age well live seven and a half years younger. Can you imagine longer. almost a just, decade more life? Yeah, for just because you are happy to do it. <laughs> I'm feeling like sunshine, like springtime, like something's in the water and I'm taking a deep dive. I'm feeling so weightless, like I'm gonna make it. And nothing in the universe can take this I can see it clearly now Nothing gonna bring me down